everyone. I am Lynn Carson, your baker in for today, and I will be talking about damaged starch. Why is this important? Well, because it can cause bread to crack on the top. It can cause overproofing, inconsistent volume or size, sticky dough, poor shelf life, and inconsistent color, and so on. So this is why damaged starch is so important. And I suggest if you need to learn more about damaged starch, please go to Wikipedia and type in damaged starch on the search bar and you will learn more on how to control this particular aspect of your flour quality. Um, I have additional information here with me today that I like to share. Um, and this is a particular infographic from KPM Analytics. So basically, um, damaged starch is the endosperm part of the kernel, right? Um, the kernel is made out of 70% starch. So when it goes through the mills, um, it gets damaged by the rollers. That's how uh, damaged starch it happens in the end product and in the flour that you receive from the miller. Well, the positive side of things is it will provide a higher absorption vol uh, yield to you, uh, therefore, you know, increasing your uh, total product yield from a particular batch of flour. Problem is, it too much of damaged starch can actually make your dough sticky. Um, therefore, a balance needs to be found between the protein level and the starch damage. If everything goes well, you're going to have a product that actually has a better shelf life and is fresher over a longer period of time. Basically, damaged starch leads to higher sugar production, which will help with your volume and your color as well. Depending on what you're making, whether it's cookies or pan bread, you're going to have a certain amount of damaged starch to deal with. So how would you measure damaged starch? Well, this is why we're here today, folks. We're going to be talking about the Chopin SD-Matic. It's simple, fast, and does everything rapidly under 10 minutes. Not only is it a standardized method, it can really help bakers and millers um, with the consistency of the flour. Okay, so if you need more information, contact Chopin. Their email is below, and um, for more information, go to kpmanalytics.com. All right. SD-MATIC is based on the Emperometric method developed by Metcalf and Gills in 1966. Yes, this particular method is pretty tried and true. It proves that the iodine absorption capacity of flour is proportional to its starch damage content. In reality, SD-MATIC measures iodine absorption in a diluted flour suspension at a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the more iodine that's absorbed by the flour, the more starch damage that's in the flour. To learn more about this particular method and to really get an expert's opinion on this, I reached out to Dr. Jane Bach, the amazing technical director at the Wheat Marketing Center. Hi, Jane. Welcome today. Can you tell us how do you perform a test on the SD-MATIC? Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to walk you through how to run an SD-MATIC test. So the instrument is here. And I've already prepared my solution. So this is a solution of 120 grams of water, 3 grams of potassium iodide, 
1.5 grams of citric acid and just a couple drops of sodium thiosulfate. Right now I have it in the little heating chamber right now just to bring it up to temperature. I'm going to pull out my solution. And I'm going to enter all the test information into the touchscreen instrument. So to start, I'm going to hit the test button and I can enter all the flour information here. I've weighed out my gram of flour and it is accurate to the third decimal point. I don't need to change that. I have the option to adjust my water content. and then to adjust my protein content. And once I do that, the solution has reached 35 degrees now and iodine is slowly being liberated from uh, potassium iodide and right now the instrument is measuring that amperometric current and we're waiting for that current to reach a maximum before the flour will be released into the solution. And so you'll start to see this milliampere value start to increase. Mm -hmm. And at the top, this is just a timer showing you how much time has elapsed since the solution reached 35 degrees. So we've reached stage five. The flour is being introduced into the solution right now. And what we hear is this vibratory feeder. So we're not actually introducing the flour ourselves. The instrument handles that for us. And now that the sample's in solution, the damaged starch is going to begin taking up that free iodine and you'll start to see the solution turning from a more yellow color to something that's more blue or purple in color. Once that reading stabilizes, the instrument will calculate the iodine absorption and then it will calculate the starch damage based on that iodine absorption value. The test is done now and the estimatic provides a range of values, some directly measured and some calculated. The directly measured value is the iodine absorption value, so the AI, and that comes up as 93.31% for this sample. The standard reporting value for estimatic is the Chopin Dubois unit, so UCD. Uncorrected, that value is 19.1 for this sample. Corrected for moisture content, and protein content, that value is 18.4. Additionally, you can um, have an integrated calibration put into the unit as well that provides AACC uh, percent starch damage and fair end units as well. Someone may say hesitate between the enzymatic method and SDmatic. What are the actual advantages of SDmatic? In making a decision between the estimatic and the enzymatic method, there are some advantages to using the estimatic method. The first of which is that the number of pieces of ancillary equipment is essentially zero. You just need the estimatic unit. With the enzymatic method, there's stirs, there's ovens, there's a spectrophotometer. So there are a lot of pieces of equipment that you need to have in place to run that method. The second advantage of the estimatic is that your operators don't really need to have any kind of specialized training. They're literally just weighing out reagents and the flour and then turning the instrument on and letting it do the test. They also don't need to watch time with respect to length of time for reactions and things like that. So they can start the instrument, walk away, do something else, and then come back and collect the results. And then finally, one of the biggest advantages of the estimatic is that you essentially have your results in less than 10 minutes. 
With the enzymatic method, it's going to take closer to an hour before you have your starch damage results. So it's a much more rapid test. 10 minutes. I say that's a wonderful rapid test that can be implemented into a QA receiving procedure. So Jane, say I use an enzymatic method like the AACC 76-31.01. Can I keep my reference with the enzymatic? You can keep your reference method. The values and the numbers that you're getting are slightly different because you're measuring different things, but the results track with one another. We've run the Megazyme kit and the Estimatic side by side, for example, and the results are very highly correlated. Additionally, if there is um, a specific calibration that you need developed for the Estimatic for your particular operation, uh, Chopin Technologies has been kind enough to do that for our Estimatic and they do offer it for um, for all their customers. So it is possible to keep your reference method and still use the SDMATIC. Is the SDMATIC method a standardized method? Yes, there are several standardized methods available for the SDMATIC, including AACC and ICC methods. Is it possible to analyze other types of flour like rye or rice? with the SDMATIC chain? Of course you can measure other materials with the SDMATIC. The thing to keep in mind though is that all the calculations for most of the values were based on white wheat flour, so if you're measuring other materials, just report the iodine absorption value. Why is it important to control the damaged starch content, Jane? You want to control your damaged starch because it affects several aspects of baking. Damaged starch will absorb approximately 10 times more water than native starch. So while you tend to think of that from a positive standpoint, more water leads to more dough yield and things like that, there are negative aspects to having too much starch damage. Your dough becomes sticky, bake-off becomes a bit of a problem in the oven, your product texture becomes gummy, and you might experience more rapid staling uh, with more damaged starch. As you know, we can't possibly have zero damaged starch. So Jane, what is the optimal damaged starch content that we should target? There's really no optimal starch damage target to hit for all flours. It really depends on the flour and the product. But a general rule of thumb is the higher the protein content and the harder the wheat kernel texture, the more starch damage that you'll obtain from milling and the more starch damage that that flour can um, safely hold. So if you're thinking about something like pan breads, which higher protein contents, harder wheat kernel textures, starch damage values in terms of percentage uh, would be in the six to eight percent range. If you're thinking about that in UCD values, that might be somewhere in the 19 to 24 UCD uh, range. If we're talking about a product like a cookie though, you want very, very minimal starch damage, basically as little as you can get. So you're trying to keep that typically down somewhere in that 11 to 15 UCD range, typically 3% or less starch damage. So where does damaged starch come from, Jane? Damaged starch is created in the process of milling, and there are really two factors that control the level of starch damage that's generated. The first is the hardness of the wheat kernel. The harder the wheat kernel, the more starch damage you're going to generate during milling. With soft wheat kernels, that protein matrix isn't very strongly adhered to the starch granule, and so when you mill it, you can basically separate along the line between the starch granule and the protein matrix, and so you don't really see a lot of starch damage. With a harder wheat kernel, that protein matrix is very tightly adhered to the starch granule, and so in order to separate the endosperm up into flour particles, you sometimes physically have to break through the starch granule, and that's what creates uh, damaged starch. The other factor that influences damaged starch is how aggressively you're milling. So if you're um, setting really tight roll gaps with a lot of pressure, you have more reductions in your process, you're going to generate more starch damage simply because you are creating more stress on that kernel over time. 
So those are the two factors that really determine how much starch damage you come out with at the end of any milling process. I don't think we can quite control the damaged starch level sometimes. If we receive a high amount of damaged starch, how can we correct the flour with an excess level of damaged starch, Jane? You can correct a flour that has too much or too little starch damage. You can use um, different blending options. You can blend different streams. You can add some gluten. You can add amylases, for example. But those are really expensive ways of dealing with the problem. Really, the best fix for uh, starch damage, making sure that you're generating the right amount, is to make sure that your milling process is set up correctly in the first place. That's the most cost-efficient way to do it. Thank you, Jane. I knew I could always rely on you on flower quality issues. Remember, folks, if you need flower quality advice, reach out to Dr. Jane Bach at the Wheat Marketing Center here in Portland, Oregon. All right, that's all I have to share today on damaged starch. If you're interested in monitoring your damaged starch levels, please reach out to our sponsors at KPM Analytics at sales at kpmanalytics.com or click onto the uh, email on uh, the link below. All right. And you can always visit their website at kpmanalytics.com. Lots and lots of information on there. Okay. Thank you for joining me today on this Bakerin session, and I will see all of you soon. Bye.